Hi, welcome to the 11th session of Pirate Smugglers in the Making of the Modern World. Last week we were looking at some factors that contributed to the explosive growth of smuggling and certain kinds of piracy, as we'll see, in the second half of the 20th century. We were looking particularly at issues of globalization, the opening up of the world's economy, but we considered in particular things like the rise of protectionist tariffs and other types of protectionist devices in developing countries as they struggled after the Great Depression and after World War II to industrialize their own societies. And then we considered another very significant factor for one type of smuggling, and that was the beginnings of a global effort to control certain types of substances, narcotics in particular, and how this would contribute as well to an explosive growth in smuggling. Today what we're going to do is take some of those factors and look at how they actually resulted in significant amounts of smuggling from 1945 to 1975. What are the real stories behind these abstractions that we were talking about last week? How did they actually work themselves out? In the first half, we'll be looking particularly at certain types of goods that were being smuggled into these protectionist regimes after 1945. And then in the second half, we're going to continue to look at a little bit of that, but then we're going to switch over and examine in particular the drug trade and how the drug trade grew after 1945, what kind of factors contributed to it, what were the roles of various drug types such as heroin, marijuana, cocaine, etc., uh, and how did these substances and their markets respond to efforts to regulate, in fact, ban them in places like the United States, but also throughout the world in the years after World War II. First of all, in looking at smuggling from 1945 to 1975, when we talked about this period last week, I specifically pointed to these efforts at import substitution industrialization and how administrations throughout the third world, the newly decolonized world, were using various devices such as tariffs, licensing of uh, certain products. In other words, you had to have a license to import certain products and also creating either state-run monopolies in certain products or allowing certain private enterprises to essentially create monopolies in certain industrial areas. And all of these factors, of course, just as they had in earlier centuries, contributed to smuggling of certain types of items. Now, in particular, I mentioned that the target of much of this protectionist legislation was consumer goods because the idea essentially behind import substituting industrialization was to say we will control, limit the import of consumer goods and meanwhile we will build industries within our own countries to produce those same types of goods. And we're going to see some of that today, but we'll also see some goods that at times will strike you as throwbacks to the past. And we're going to talk about diamonds and gold, and it would seem, well, you know, weren't those the kinds of things that were being smuggled back in the age of, you know, the spice trade and uh, the age of you know, the Spanish main, etc. cetera. Uh, and that's true, but there are also very specific reasons why these types of products would also be the target of these protectionist regimes, and really for the same kinds of reasons, because they are trying to industrialize. We'll see exactly how these particular goods play into that pattern. Uh, some specific examples of what we're going to be looking at in, in controlling consumer goods. Uh, quotas on the import of Scotch whiskey in South America. This is a logical one. I mean, it would be considered certainly by most people to be a luxury, first of all, as a consumer item. Most people you know, do not drink Scotch whiskey, and it would be expensive in most uh, third world countries. It's expensive in most countries, period. Uh, and at the same time, it would be considered to some degree as an item that may be damaging to one's health. It depends on which uh, particular experts you talk to, but uh, it often is associated as a distilled liquor. Remember, prohibition and so forth. People put it in the same category often as tobacco, as this is something you could certainly do without. So both for very sound economic reasons, but also for some other reasons involving concerns with people's health and moral issues. Um, it was easy, relatively speaking, to put controls on scotch because this was sort of like a syntax, you know, we're controlling something that probably isn't that good for you anyways, depending on who you are. In India, uh, we're going to examine a ban on gold. And as I said, uh, this is the kind of thing where you might 
think, well, this is really a throwback to the trading empires uh, if we're worried about gold. But we will see that gold is serving a very specific purpose here in terms of uh, entrepreneurs and consumers who are trying to essentially protect money that they're earning in societies where the exchange rates tend to fluctuate uh, significantly. So this is an attempt by consumers and industrialists and others to sort of hoard their money, protect their savings, and we'll see how that plays into these uh, protectionist regimes and how it leads to a ban on gold and therefore massive smuggling of it. In Italy, we have one of the classic cases of uh, trying to maintain a monopoly in a consumer good, in this case a cigarette monopoly. Uh, these were, as I've said before, very common around the world at this time, not only in Europe, but third world countries. China had a cigarette monopoly throughout the 20th century, still maintains it today. Uh, and this, of course, is another sort of likely consumer product that if it is under control and it is, as a result, high priced, it's going to lead to smuggling. We will see how those factors uh, contribute to wide-scale smuggling of cigarettes in the 20th century. In fact, cigarettes have sometimes been described, although the statistics aren't really there to prove it, but cigarettes were often described as the most smuggled consumer item in the past 100 years. This gives us a sort of list of preferred items. What were the kinds of things that were most commonly smuggled at this time? And they were items like whiskey, where there are quotas and controls, cigarettes, where you've got monopolies, uh, diamonds, and gold. And both diamonds and gold, as we will see, serve similar purposes in terms of people being uh, able to latch on to them in economies where exchange rates fluctuate where they may want to be able to get their money out of the country and invest it elsewhere in more secure currencies and that helps create or generate much of the demand for these two items although as we will see diamonds also have a uh, sort of generic attraction as a consumer item uh, particularly in certain societies like the United States and Japan where they are seen of course uh, at least promoted primarily as a form of adornment and a sign of one's status in society. On the one hand, some of these items, particularly watches, and we're going to look at the smuggling of watches as well, uh, are looking towards the future. And by that, I mean that even in the period we're talking about, although consumer items are key items in the smuggling process, still consumerism has not spread as widely as it will in later decades. Consumers, as we think of them, are buying everyday products and items, uh, appliances, automobiles, etc. Most of people in the third world still can't participate in that kind of system. We're usually talking about the elite and at least some of the upper income segments of the middle class who can do this. So we still have a relatively restricted consumer society in most nations of the world after 1945. on the other hand, we see with uh, wristwatches, and we'll look at them, uh, that they are becoming a sort of common consumer item. Cigarettes are too, but cigarettes, of course, have other connotations in terms of uh, wanting to control them for health reasons, etc. Uh, but watches are sort of the every man's consumer item uh, of the mid 20th century, the kind of thing that had worldwide appeal and that an increasing number of people could afford to buy. And when we look at smuggling of this kind of item, we're looking at what we're going to see on a massive scale next week, where every type of significant consumer item is being smuggled probably somewhere in the world at a given moment. Of course, some things are also old in this picture of smuggling. Some of the mechanisms that we will see used to smuggle after uh, World War II are very much the same kinds of mechanisms that were being used for centuries to smuggle spices into Portugal, etc. One of the key ones, under invoicing. In other words, your shipment is twice the size of what you report on your invoice. What you're doing, of course, is trying to get past the customs people and pretend that you're only importing half of the goods that you're bringing in. Some of these mechanisms are old as the hills. On the other hand, and at the same time, I should say, there are also some traditional ties in terms of smuggling. And by that, I mean that over the centuries, merchant communities have traditionally been tied together by family relationships. If we look at merchant relationships between merchants in Spain and uh, Spanish colonies in South America, if we look at 
uh, colonial merchants in North America and England. We look at Chinese merchants uh, in their homeland and those who migrated to uh, Southeast Asia, to Indonesia, and so forth. What we see consistently repeated down through the centuries are family ties. People related to each other engaged in this trade. And it's for a simple reason. In earlier centuries in particular, it was very difficult to enforce uh, any kind of international commercial transaction. In other words, if you ship goods off to a merchant uh, and you're in London and he's in Boston and uh, he decides that he's going to sell all the goods and he's not going to give you a dime and therefore he steals everything, uh, it really isn't that easy to track him down. Even if he's working in a major urban center, colonial urban center like Boston, uh, if he heads out of town and takes up business again in some smaller residence, chances are you'll never be able to catch him. Because of that, because it's so difficult to enforce these kinds of commercial transactions internationally, people relied on family connections in order to make the commercial system work. That was true after World War II as well, particularly among ethnic groups who had migrated over time, sometimes because of economic reasons, sometimes because of ethnic persecutions. It varies. But we look at groups like Armenians, Pakistanis, Indians, Chinese, and a host of other people who were involved in these mass migrations in the middle of the 20th century. This made it possible for them, to, again, to use family connections to maintain and develop these commercial relations. But what it also means is that Family connections also function effectively for smugglers. Because even though after World War II, it becomes increasingly possible to enforce international commercial transactions, nevertheless, if you're a smuggler, you're pretty much in the same situation as a colonial merchant back in the 18th, 17th century, or whatever. And that is, what legal recourse do you have to enforce the transaction that you've been carrying out? Uh, you give someone a train load of cigarettes to smuggle into Italy, they smuggle them in, sell them, and then they fly the coop. What do you do? Do you go to the local gendarme and complain, you know, <laughs> hey, you stole all my smuggled cigarettes? You can't do that. So one of the few ways, and most smugglers at this time are not violent, this is not a type of activity, it may be illegal, but it's not an activity that invites and tends to encourage any extensive use of violence. So short of violence, what are you going to do to protect yourself against the possibility that you have someone who is not going to treat you honestly in your own Ill illegal activity? Well, the one sure answer usually is that if it's a cousin, a brother, a nephew, whatever, it's far less likely that that person is going to try to cheat you. So these kinds of traditional family ties, which had long facilitated trade relationships, remain important after 1945, especially when it came to smuggling, because at this time, as well as in the past, there really is no effective way to enforce these agreements when people are involved in smuggling. Now, in addition to something old, there's also some things new. One is the increased network of telecommunications that connects the world. Now this is well before the internet, the World Wide Web, but nevertheless we do have a rapid expansion of telecommunications systems, particularly in the 1930s and 40s and well into the 50s and 60s, meaning improved radio transmissions, telephone connections that are now truly universal, uh, teletype systems that, again, have extended to encompass the globe. So now it is much easier to communicate and to arrange smuggling operations. Now you can tell people just minutes before they arrive, let us say, on a ship in New York where they're smuggling in diamonds or whatever, who it is that they're actually going to meet. Uh, you can plan things down to the last detail in terms of timing because there are almost instantaneous communications to allow you to make these kinds of arrangements and to avoid, for example, have to s having to sit offshore for days, you know, waiting for another ship to show up to transfer your goods to. Now this can be done almost instantaneously. Another factor in terms of technology is the increase of commercial flights. There is an explosive growth after World War II in particular because air vessels that were developed for war purposes, bombers, for example, 
that were developed during the war are now adapted by their makers to commercial activity. So you have much larger, faster planes that are now being used to move goods and passengers. And of course, airlines, because they had not been involved in massive movement of cargo in the past, were not a focal point of customs enforcement. It's not that you, you know, could fly in the plane and not pay any customs, it's just that because, relatively speaking, air cargo was a very small part of world shipment of goods, there was far less attention focused on uh, the enforcement of customs duties in airports and at airlines uh, than there were in other areas, particularly ships, trains, etc. As a result, at least for a time, there was a window of opportunity in the first 15 years or so after World War II, in particular up to the early 60s, where smugglers are able to take advantage of relatively lax enforcement, uh, which is in part also due to the great explosive growth of air cargo and movement of people. Uh, obviously, the custom system, inspection systems, aren't likely to keep up with that rapid growth. And they are, are for a time, able to exploit this. And the ways that they do it are sort of classic by bribing people, you know, bribing the crews, bribing airline officials to provide information. We'll see how that works specifically uh, in a particular smuggling case. In addition to that, uh, there was the training of couriers. And couriers are, you know, what in the drug trade today, today are known as mules. Uh, people were going to actually carry the goods. Uh, people became literally professionals as couriers moving goods like diamonds, gold, uh, through the airline system, carrying them on their person, and literally moving these goods around within a few hours across multiple national borders. And they became an important factor in the new smuggling process using airlines. And of course, there's the traditional methods as well, manipulating air manifests, which is the same thing as saying under invoicing, you know, that you're saying you're only shipping half the goods that you really are shipping. Certain cities emerged as centers for airline smuggling. Uh, particularly places like Geneva, Frankfurt, Paris, Brussels, Hong Kong. Part of this has to do with the simple fact that, like Paris, they were hubs for international connections. You know, people flying, let us say, from the United States uh, into certainly significant parts of Africa and the Middle East, etc., would almost certainly go through Paris. Uh, Part of it is their function as airline hubs, international airline hubs. And this was the place that you wanted to move the goods in and out of because there are so many opportunities to get goods easily from one region of the world to another. Uh, other than that, certain specialized factors. For example, Switzerland was a very important part of the gold trade. And therefore, not surprisingly, Geneva would become a significant center for the air shipment of smuggled gold. Hong Kong, as, and Hong Kong will appear time and again today when I'm talking about smuggling centers because it's a free port, meaning there is little attention being paid to the close inspection of goods that are being imported and exported from Hong Kong because the whole idea is you're supposed to be able to move goods in and out of here easily because they're not paying any customs duties. So what is the purpose of inspection? Well, the only purpose of inspection is to prevent smuggling of goods into other countries and you know, there isn't that much concern on the part of uh, British officials in Hong Kong over you know, whether they're closely inspecting this stuff or not. Uh, it's not like they're losing any money on this. So each city is some type of international air hub, and then there are usually other factors that contribute to why it becomes a key smuggling center on these air routes. The first example we're going to look at of, let's say, consumer goods smuggling is cigarettes in Italy. Italy, one of those states that has established a state monopoly uh, for the manufacture and sale of cigarettes within its country. Uh, in terms of price, the issue is very simple. Uh, for nationally produced cigarettes, pr cigarettes produced by the monopoly, uh, you basically paid 29 cents. If you wanted imported cigarettes, you paid 64 cents. Meanwhile, just north of Italy, bordering on Italy, was Switzerland, where import duties on foreign cigarettes were pretty low. So you could get them for 13 cents. You could buy foreign cigarettes, US cigarettes, for example, were particularly popular. You get them for 13 cents. Simple mathematics. We can smuggle them over the border into Italy. And despite the costs involved in smuggling, we can still sell them for 48 cents. So we can sell them for 25% less than you can buy an imported cigarette in Italy. 
Why would people be buying imports to begin with, since even the smuggled ones are more expensive than the national ones? Well, first of all, it was felt that the nationally produced cigarettes were of inferior quality. At least many people felt that way. Secondly, and equally importantly, is that cigarettes were becoming, of course, a major consumer good. American and British cigarette companies, tobacco manufacturers, were pouring huge amounts of money into advertising to associate cigarettes, of course, with the American lifestyle, with being cool, you know, being suave. Uh, American GIs had been freely provided with cigarettes during World War II. It became sort of hip, and of course, movies, if you look at Casablanca and any number of movies that were made during and immediately after the war, you know, the, um, sort of dark cinematography of the United States in the late 40s and early 50s, time and again, cigarettes appear everywhere. So people are getting a connection that it isn't just smoking, but it's smoking certain kinds of brands of cigarettes that give you those kinds of attributes, besides yellow teeth, bad breath, and maybe cancer, uh, that if you want to be masculine, if you want to be American, feminine was not a big issue at that time, later on, you know, they start pushing that, but the big issue was, you know, men smoked. If you want those kind of attributes, if you want people to associate, with, associate you with those kinds of images, you smoked cigarettes, you smoked American cigarettes. So besides the fact that many people felt that the national manufactured brand was inferior, there was the simple fact that American cigarettes, because of mass advertising, did have this cachet about them that this is the kind of thing that you want to be associated with. Now, as a result of the disparities in price, that it was so much cheaper to buy smuggled imports than to buy legally imported import cigarettes, we see in 1966 that two and a half billion cigarettes were smuggled, which is about 50 cigarettes per capita. In other words, for every man, woman, and child in Italy, they were smuggling in 50 imported smuggled cigarettes. This is a high ratio when you figure maybe 25, 30 percent of the adult population smokes. Uh, that means there are plenty of smuggled cigarettes for anybody that wants them. They're readily available throughout the country, despite the state monopoly, despite the efforts at enforcement to prevent the illegal import, uh, and despite the fact that even the smuggled cigarettes are more expensive than the local ones. The Swiss center for smuggling was the city of Lugano, which is close to Italy's northern border. The other end of the cigarette line, smuggling line, uh, was Milan, an industrial city in northern Italy, which had excellent railroad connections with the rest of the country, and therefore, like one of these airline hubs, was a great place to smuggle goods into, because then you could rapidly distribute the goods throughout the rest of the country. To get the cigarettes across the border, uh, Italian farm workers called Spalloni uh, were used. They would essentially take huge packs. Uh, they would walk across the border. It was relatively open border. I mean, there were guards at the main roads, etc. But of course, these people aren't going to walk up to the guards and go across. They all go over the hilly countryside into Switzerland. They have large canvas packs on their back. They load it up with cartons of cigarettes and walk back. It's not a very difficult operation. It's not very dangerous. People are very unlikely to shoot you unless some farmer thinks you're just getting into his territory. Uh, and therefore, they can bring across a significant number of cigarettes simply by using uh, these human bearers. Now, cigarettes are also shipped across in trains. Uh, they're also shipped across in trucks, although the risk is higher there because you are going to have to use the main roads, and there's a good chance you're going to be inspected. Nevertheless, there's a mounting flow of cigarettes. Cigarette smuggling was so pervasive uh, that it even involved the local Catholic clergy, which is where I came up with a bit about Marlboro men of the cloth. There was a particular incident in the early 1960s at the Capucin Monastery of San Francesco. And there was a phone call one night uh, to the local police reporting that there was a dead man in the garden of the monastery. How he got there, of course, nobody was willing to say. Shortly after that, the police learned that, in addition, an ambulance was racing to town uh, with an injured man in it, and accompanying the injured man uh, was Friar Antonio Corsi. Uh, Friar Corsi was actually the head of the monastery, uh, and as it turns out, he was also the head of their cigarette smuggling operation. 
locals were a little bit suspicious of the fact that uh, many of the monks were driving late model cars, which kind of <laughs> went beyond their usual, you know, modest standards of life. Uh, what had happened is that the monastery had become a major center for truck shipment of cigarettes into the region, uh, that they would be stored there temporarily and then broken down into smaller packs in terms of smaller sections to be shipped out in smaller vehicles and, and distributed in the local areas. However, on this particular evening, uh, as the truck full of smuggled cigarettes was being backed in through the gates of the monastery, uh, the vehicle caught one of the gates, knocked the gate down on top of two of the smugglers, and killing one of them and injuring the other. So they left the dead body in the garden, uh, and then the friar headed off with the other injured smuggler in an ambulance, and later confessed to his sins of smuggling in millions of cigarettes and making a pretty good piece of change at it. But it's an indication just how pervasive this was, that no one really took much of this. I mean, you, you'd wind up in jail for a little while uh, for smuggling. Uh, but nevertheless, this, this was not a heavily enforced kind of smuggling ban, um, as indicated by the fact that even the local priests were involved. And we can understand some of the reasons, again, why the Italian government would be less than stringent in its imposition of these measures to ban the smuggling of cigarettes into the country. One, they have huge consumer demand for them. This is a way of relieving some of that demand and preventing pent-up anger at the government for preventing uh, more significant imports, or at least imports at a more reasonable price. And then there's the factor that the smuggled cigarettes do serve at least as some check on the monopoly, that the monopoly at least has to maintain a certain standard in terms of price and quality in order to avoid losing much of its business to the smuggled cigarettes. So there are rational reasons why, you, yes, you have this ban or you have these huge import duties, you have a monopoly on cigarettes, and yet you're allowing significant smuggling to go on. And this is not just lackadaisical enforcement by the government. There is a certain logic behind this. Now, even when the friars weren't busy smuggling cigarettes, uh, Italy was being inundated in other directions. For one thing, Italy had 5,000 miles of coastline. If you think of the you know, boot shape of Italy as it uh, dips into the central Mediterranean, uh, there's a huge amount of coastline with all kinds of places you can land, boats in particular, not necessarily large vessels, but freighters from Lisbon, Rotterdam, Antwerp uh, were regularly dispatched to the Italian coastline with hundreds of thousands of cigarettes uh, on board. And then smaller vessels from fishing villages uh, would unload the cigarettes and ship them off into the domestic economy. So even when cigarettes aren't pouring down the pipeline uh, from Switzerland, they're coming in in all directions along the coast. Now there's a larger market for smuggled cigarettes uh, that goes around the globe. And it, of course, brings up the issue of, you know, it's supposed to be usually high-value items, we assume, uh, that are being smuggled. And again, the point about cigarettes is that they're actually a very low-value item, but virtually universally in the world in the 20th century. Cigarettes have been either heavily taxed, had huge import duties imposed upon them, or, at the very least, uh, been monopolized by the state system. It's these taxes, state control, that of course raises the price astronomically. It's like in the United States, I don't even know what a pack of cigarettes goes for these days, but let's say five or six dollars, and you know 90% of that is just taxes between federal, state, local taxes. This is what drives the cigarettes up. So even though cigarettes aren't what we'd consider a high value item, nevertheless, they become a high value item because st states around the world have universally treated them as a readily available source of taxation or income, whether it's through monopolies or through taxes, they can suck up huge amounts of revenue through cigarettes, and as a result, they turn them into a high-value item that's readily smuggled. Uh, a couple of places where this occurs. Uh, Malaysia was a major source of smuggling of cigarettes into the Philippines, to Manila and elsewhere. Philippines have some of the same problems as Italy. They've got, you know, thousands and thousands of miles of coastline. It's an archipelago, a whole series of islands. Very difficult to prevent this. And as local officials admitted, many coastal communities, and we will see this again in later decades, that in the Philippines, many coastal communities over the years, uh, which were impoverished, had built 
their economies on smuggling. I mean, it was what they knew. It was the focus of their economic activity. Without it, they'd be totally impoverished. They would be at the point of total desperation. So again, local officials aren't exactly going to break a lot of backs in enforcing this kind of ban when they know that uh, this type of activity is so essential to the bare necessities of the economics of these small villages. Spain is another example. Uh, Spain also has a monopoly and has high taxation, and it too is a source of significant smuggling. In this case, the sources are particularly the Canary Islands, often the Atlantic, and Ceuta, which is a port uh, on the north coast of Africa, just across uh, from the Spanish coast. Uh, the significant fact about these two places, they're both free ports. Just like Hong Kong, they're places where goods can come and go without being taxed. Again, it makes them the most logical of smuggling entrepots. Where is smuggling going to occur? Almost inevitably at these places because goods are coming and going not only without taxation, but without a lot of inspection. So it's relatively easy to launch smuggling operations from there, particularly when you have a place like Spain with an economy that is establishing either high taxes or protectionist duties on a particular product, in this case, cigarettes. Other centers for cigarette smuggling, Hong Kong, Lebanon, Paraguay, Netherlands Antilles. Netherlands Antilles, like we talked about St. Eustatius. Uh, Curaçao is another one. We'll come back to that one in the Caribbean. Uh, Kuwait in the Middle East, Panama and Central America, uh, and the Canary Islands once again. The importance of why do I give you this long list? Because they all fit the same pattern. They all essentially have free port systems, free trade zones. Uh, Pan uh, not Panama. Uh, Paraguay is a little different in some sense. We'll see uh, Paraguay in other contexts in a minute. Uh, let's say it has a very free-flowing uh, trade system. Uh, it, in fact, lives on smuggling in many ways. But the others all fall into the simple description of being free trade zones. Again, you can bring goods in, take them out. There's no tariff to be paid. And there isn't going to be a lot of close inspection because the whole idea is you're supposed to be able to move goods quickly through this system. So they all become centers for smuggling because when you look at these places and then you look in the near vicinity, you look at Panama, well, just to the south of it are all these South American countries with high protectionist barriers, with the monopolies, etc. So cigarette smuggling is going to flourish there because you get a free trade zone right next to a highly protected set of economies. Now, proof on smuggling of cigarettes, of course, might seem a little difficult to get, of course, because smugglers aren't, you know, keeping statistics of this is how much we smuggled. Uh, but there is a certain smoking gun. Uh, when you trace these free trade zones, these trading uh, smuggling centers, and look at the number of cigarettes they import, the statistics are quite striking. In Hong Kong, and this is just U.S. cigarettes, per capita consumption, at least according to their import statistics, because they do keep track of how many cigarettes they import. Hong Kong, uh, supposedly there were 678 cigarettes per capita being imported into Hong Kong. In Netherlands Antilles, 6,598. And in Kuwait, 2,537. That means every man, woman, and child in each of these countries is supposedly smoking, well, let's say 6,000 cigarettes a year. They must have serious <laughs> tobacco coughs. Um, obviously, the idea is that most of these cigarettes are not staying there. People are not consuming, you know, you know, per capita, a thousand, two thousand, three thousand, five thousand cigarettes. These things are flowing in and then flowing right out again. So the import statistics do help verify the sheer size of the smuggling operations because they tell you huge numbers of cigarettes are coming in far more than the local population could ever possibly consume. So most of it even though it's not going to be recorded, it has to be smuggled out again. We can assume that about 90% of this stuff is going right out again in the form of smuggling. Now, another product that is somewhat similar because, again, it was sort of identified as something perhaps people shouldn't do, might be damaging their health, uh, was scotch whiskey. Now, with scotch, there's another issue because uh, smuggling is encouraged not only by quotas, tariffs, etc., on the product, but also by the fact that you really can't reproduce it elsewhere. If you're going to make real Scotch whiskey, you make it in Scotland, okay? Because of soil, because of grain types, etc. Uh, so it's not as if at some point 
uh, let's say, South American countries that are putting quotas on this stuff uh, are going to suddenly start producing it on their own. That's not going to happen. So there's going to be this ongoing demand for a product that these countries are either, you know, limiting the import of, taxing heavily, you know, or banning entirely. There's always going to be this demand because they're never going to be able to substitute their own product because the only place you make scotch is in Scotland. Uh, in Spain, uh, the approach was not a ban uh, or a quota, but high tariffs. You know, so you'd pay a huge amount of money, you'd make it very expensive, three, five times what it would cost otherwise. And once again, of course, it was smuggled extensively from free ports in the area. Ceuta, Gibraltar, the Canary Islands. You know, it's the uh, same list of suspects. You, know, you come up with them time and again. Gibraltar uh, has an interesting statistic in terms of what it was doing for importing of Scotch whiskey. It was importing two gallons per inhabitant. You know, which is a lot to drink. Uh, the Canaries uh, were doing even better. They were bringing in two and a half gallons per inhabitant. And again, you're talking every person from adult through infant is supposedly absorbing this. And again, the obvious answer to this is now most of the stuff is pouring right out again, literally, uh, from the Canary Islands, etc., and Gibraltar right in to Spain uh, to be consumed there. The same kind of process that we see with cigarettes. With South America, the centers are places like Curaçao, which is part of the Netherlands Antilles, Aruba, Panama, again. What they all have in common, they're all free trade zones. They're all sitting right at the edge of a highly protected market. It's a perfect place to bring your product in. You get close. You're only, you know, 100 miles from the coast, in some cases, of Venezuela or Colombia. You know, it's a hop, skip, and a jump to get over on the other side. And in many cases, we will see uh, next week, uh, Colombians, for example, actually go uh, onto the islands to buy the goods and then bring them back themselves. So you don't even have to smuggle it in. People will come and get it for you and take it into the domestic economy for you. Diamonds wouldn't appear to be part of this sort of consumer good process uh, because, of course, they strike everyone as... You know, a luxury good. This was uh, the kind of exotic item we talked about when we talked about spices and silks from Asia. Uh, but in fact, diamonds have a very practical purpose too, as we will see. Now, one of the reasons why diamonds will be smuggled is because just about every country imposes significant import and export duties on them. <coughs> the most basic reason is, again, it's looked upon as a luxury consumer item. It's a luxury tax. You know, people can't really howl. Most of the population isn't going to scream that the price of diamonds has gone too high. You know, well, if they've gone too high, then you can certainly afford to live without them. You don't need the diamonds. Uh, but the other critical reason why smuggling flourished in diamonds, particularly after 1945, was that diamonds served as a medium of exchange. In other words, they were as good as U.S. dollars or British pounds in the international market. They kept their value. And as we will see, the reason they kept their value is because there is a system that uh, has monopoly control over their purchase and marketing. So that system actually keeps the price level and at a certain point. So, but that means you can count on the fact that when you buy a diamond today, you know, even though your exchange rate, let's say the exchange rate in your country is 30 of the local currency to $1, okay, you buy the diamond at that point and then the currency slips to 50 to a dollar. So now it would take 50 of your local currency to buy $1. Well, it doesn't make any difference because that diamond hasn't lost its value. Okay? If the diamond was worth $100 a year ago, it's worth at least 100 or more now. So this is a way to guarantee your money, even though your exchange rate may fluctuate and damage your savings if they're in cash. If you put it into diamonds, they're virtually guaranteed in terms of their price level. At least they were for some time. Uh, and generally still are. But plus the fact that diamonds are easy to smuggle. You know, in gold, we will see gold to smuggle too, but you've got a bit of a problem with gold is heavy. Uh, it's hard to lug it around. But diamonds are relatively light, relatively small. You can put a lot of money into a small bag of diamonds. So again, it's an ideal form of exchange. If you have to leave the country suddenly, there's a revolution, you know, the economy collapses. You know, and just grab a couple of bags of diamonds, get out of town, and you're all set. You're carrying your wealth with you. 
there are also uh, in the same countries a hedge against inflation because most developing countries at this time and even today suffer from serious inflationary problems. Again, uh, diamonds are going to go up in value whereas the local currency will be undermined in value by domestic inflation. So here is another appeal of diamonds, why people would want so badly to acquire them. Now, on the other hand, we'll also see there are just simple consumer reasons for the appeal of diamonds. But first of all, there is a specific marketing network that deals with diamonds. Uh, diamond dealers across the world are usually closely connected. Many of them have family connections, uh, belong to the same associations. So there really is sort of an international brotherhood. But more than that, there is the De Beers Central Selling Organization. De Beers has controlled the vast majority, at least 80% or more, of the diamond market throughout most of the 20th century for more than 70 years. This group arranges for the purchase of diamonds coming out of Africa in particular and for their sale to dealers. There are regular sales held. I think there's usually, or at least there used to be back in the time we're talking about, about half a dozen major sales a year uh, where diamond merchants come and bid on packets of diamonds. And there is where we get the established price for diamonds that is effective around the world. But the other important function that the De Beers Group serves is this, that if prices start to fall, if it starts looking like world price on diamonds are going to start to fall, what De Beers does is start storing diamonds. They stop selling as many diamonds. They have sufficient financing so they can hold diamonds off the market until the price starts to rise again. So if oversupply starts to become a threat, they pull back, they put less diamonds on the market, and the price comes back up. That's why people could rely on the stability of diamond prices and use them as a medium of exchange, as a way of hedging against inflation. Now, the key diamond, or one of the key centers for diamond production in the world, uh, is in South Africa, in the great diamond mines around Kimberley. Uh, and this is one of the areas where diamond smuggling went on on a significant basis. Probably about 10% of the diamonds that were produced at Kimberley were being bought illegally. They call it illegal buying. It's ultimately a form of smuggling. The basic idea was that the workers in the mines would find various ways to hide at least a diamond or two here or there on their bodies, uh, escape the inspection process, and eventually sell them to people who would gather in the mining towns uh, and be on the lookout for people working in the mines who had diamonds to sell. So there was a sort of ongoing seepage of about 10% of the production, despite the security system. And it was estimated back in the 60s that about $50 million in diamonds were being smuggled out of uh, South Africa every year. Now, just to the west of South Africa is what's known as Southwest Africa. Now, also later called Namibia when it became independent. Uh, it had been a German colony for a while, then British and the South Africans had seized uh, Southwest Africa. Uh, here, the problems were more extensive in terms of trying to control uh, diamond smuggling because the diamonds are not found in deep shaft mines as they are in Kimberley. Instead, here, diamonds are spread through these vast ranges of gravel. So what you have to do is go out over tens of miles in raking up the gravel, sifting it through, and looking for the uh, uncut, the raw diamonds uh, that you'll find there. In other words, you get vast territories over which you have to exercise control. And in fact, the mining company there uh, used to have barriers, and if you wanted to drive into the territory, you had to leave your car behind and use a company car in order to avoid people driving into the territory, picking up a few diamonds, and heading out again in their car. So they did the best they could, but still, uh, there were limits on their ability to control such a vast area where diamonds could be secured. So there were limits to security, and there was a general perception among De Beers and the mining companies themselves that they were probably going to have to put up with about a 10% uh, smuggling factor. In other words, the total value or uh, quantity of what they produced in a year, about 10% would be smuggled out, uh, and they could live with that. That wouldn't radically alter the prices, and they could enforce, and in fact, 
in the mid 60s they tried for a while a more uh, intense security system but they found that the cost was really too high it wasn't worth it uh, for the amount of smuggling that they could halt so they simply accept that a certain percentage of smuggling is going to go on on a regular basis now elsewhere problems of control were more significant and we're going to see this as sort of a precursor of things that will happen in the last quarter of the 20th century, uh, specifically in what was known originally as the Belgian Congo, uh, Belgian colony, uh, the huge Central African nation known as the Republic of the Congo today. Uh, this was another key mining center for diamonds as well as other products. In 1960, uh, the Congo began moving towards independence from uh, Belgium. However, that independence quickly disintegrated as conflict broke out within the Congo uh, between various groups. Uh, the president uh, of the country, or I should say the prime minister, that was his official title, uh, Patrice Lumumba, uh, was eventually overthrown by an army general, Joseph Mobutu, later known as Mobutu Sese Seko, uh, in 1961. The country then devolved into civil war uh, involving UN forces who were trying to put down the civil war, uh, but it was torn by civil war until 1965. So pretty much from 61 to 65, there was a civil war going on in the Congo. And needless to say, government enforcement of rules about the shipment of diamonds are not exactly uh, being enforced at the greatest level uh, because people are too busy fighting this war. There are too many opportunities. In fact, the rebel forces, of course, all want to use uh, diamonds as a way of funding their operations. You get a hold of a diamond field and you can quickly come up with some money to help fund your efforts to seize control of the country. The Congo at this time was actually the major producer, or the largest producer of diamonds in the world, although many of them were not of the quality uh, being produced in South Africa, but nevertheless it was the largest producer. And during this period of chaos, um, as much as 50 percent of the production was being smuggled. Now you might say, well, gee, that must have had a really serious impact upon the uh, De Beers monopoly. It had some impact, but the fact is because of the violence of the war, production was dropping dramatically. So yes, there was a much increased level of smuggling, but on the other hand, production was going down because of the disruptions of the war itself. Nevertheless, it raises a serious problem when there is destabilization of a society, then how do you control international trade? How do you enforce customs regulations, etc.? This problem in Central Africa in the early 1960s, of course, is going to become virtually a global one in the 1980s and 90s as we have destabilization of a number of African states, the collapse of regimes in Eastern Europe, and the collapse of the Soviet Union. All of that is going to take much of the world's economy and put it in the hands of political systems that are barely struggling to survive, uh, that are torn by political unrest and by warfare. There you're going to get an explosion in smuggling as you did in the Congo in the early 1960s in regards to diamonds. Now the United States was an important market for smuggled diamonds. Obviously, we don't produce diamonds here, at least except for industrial diamonds. Uh, it was an important market because this was the world's leading consumer society at the time. It was the largest consumer society. It was the wealthiest consumer society. And Americans had certainly bought in by the 1940s and 50s into this idea that diamonds represented luxury, they represented glamour. Uh, people were convinced that you couldn't get married, you know, before you gave your beloved a diamond ring, you know, a diamond engagement ring, diamonds are forever, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Americans certainly bought into that. So there was a huge consumer market for diamonds. Uh, this was not one of the instances where people were trying to get a hold of diamonds in order to preserve capital, et cetera. This was largely a consumer market. Now, as happened in other countries, high tariffs are imposed, so diamonds are expensive, therefore diamonds are going to be smuggled. Uh, the principal ways of bringing them in were on airliners and on luxury liners, in other words, on ships coming in. And these are practical because, of course, you're not dealing with a high volume product. You're smuggling cigarettes, you know, you got to smuggle at least, you know, uh, 20 cartons, 40 cartons to make it worth your while even. Uh, whereas with diamonds, you know, you can take a bag smaller than your fist and you've got a fortune in your hands. So these were places where it could work effectively and where couriers, 
uh, in particular, operated. Uh, this is where, besides uh, in gold smuggling, as we'll see, that couriers became a major part of what was going on because these people would become essentially semi-professionals, people who were assigned to fly on planes or go across on luxury liners carrying the diamonds and get them into the country, and they became professionals at this act. Uh, now, some of it was done by under-invoicing, by you know, legitimate merchants in the diamond trade. And here you can see where family connections would work as you could trust your relatives <laughs> to help you out on this. Uh, simply under-invoicing, under-reporting, you know, the number of diamonds you're shipping to your brother who's a diamond merchant in New York or Chicago or someplace. Uh, and you can trust him, you know, to sell the diamonds and get you your profit. Uh, simple, ta you know, si systems like that were used. Hong Kong becomes another major smuggling center, and again, Hong Kong, we could say, is a major smuggling center for everything you know, that we're talking about, whether it's cigarettes, you know, diamonds, gold, you name it. Hong Kong is there because, again, it has this particular characteristic of being a free port, which makes it so easy for smuggling operations to take place. Now, diamonds are also uh, important in Japan for the same reason that they are in the United States, and that is simply that they were considered an attractive consumer item, kind of thing that people wanted to use to prove that they had reached a certain economic and social status, to prove they were part of the elite, that they were glamorous, whatever. In Indonesia, on the other hand, where diamond smuggling is also uh, significant, it is much more the idea of diamonds as an exchange medium, as diamonds are a way of preserving your capital. You buy, you earn whatever the local currency is at the time, you know, a million, you know, rupees or whatever. And how are you going to preserve that? How are you going to prevent it from being eaten away by inflation or being undermined in its real value by devaluation of the currency, which frequently occurred? You use that money to buy diamonds and invest in the diamonds. They will keep their value. And if you have to leave the country suddenly, you'll be able to take them with you and take all that value with you. Gold served a similar kind of purpose. It was just harder to move around because it was heavier. The main gold markets in the world, in the early part of the time we're talking about, the primary one, first of all, was London. Right after 1945, uh, the critical market is London. Zurich becomes important uh, as the years progress, particularly after 1968. Uh, the importance of 1968 uh, is that there was a crisis in terms of wild fluctuations in the price of gold. And an international agreement was arrived at, setting up a two-tier system for gold. From now on, after 1968, gold would be priced two different ways. Gold that was going to be used by international, or I should say multilateral agencies, like the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, those international agencies or multilateral agencies would be able to buy gold at a fixed price. On the other hand, for individuals, for the private market, the gold price would be allowed to float. So gold could rise and fall, you know, and over the last few decades you can see it go from $800 back in the days of inflation in the 70s, you know, down to 300 plus, 350 or so, you know, and it can fluctuate wildly. Uh, that began after this agreement in 1968 where you have a free market and we're going to see the effect that that has later on. But up until 1968 there was essentially a fixed price for gold. Gold had a fairly standard price that did not fluctuate a great deal. Why? Because governments around the world had an interest in keeping gold at a certain level. The most currencies in the world were backed up by gold. Most economies were on a gold standard. So they had a reason for keeping gold at a certain level. Okay? Gold is no longer the basic backup for national currencies in the world. In the United States, elsewhere, you know, people look to the dollar as the standard for international exchange these days. And that's why countries, international banks, etc., often intervene uh, to help set the price of the dollar because it is considered the standard. Back in these days, gold was the standard. It was important to keep the price of gold in a relatively narrow range. 
So gold did serve the same purpose as diamonds up until this time, up until the late 1960s. And again, when we list the centers for the smuggling of gold, they all sound, you know, it's the usual suspects. <laughs> Beirut, Hong Kong, Dubai, you haven't heard about, we're going to talk about Dubai, but Vientiane, again, another special case. Brussels, Paris, we can understand them because, you know, they're not free ports, but what are they? They're international airline centers. So one of the primary ways of moving smuggled gold was on commercial airlines. Therefore, they're going to be part of these smuggling centers. But Beirut, Hong Kong, you know, they keep coming up uh, in terms of all kinds of smuggling at this time. They have free port aspects to their economies that make that possible. Now, India is one of the classic examples of what happens uh, with gold because in 1947, India banned the import of gold. Why they banned the import of gold was fairly simple. Again, India is trying to follow the same kind of uh, economic policies that we talked about last week of import substitution industrialization. That means one of the things that they're trying to achieve is not allowing an outflow of their currency, of gold-backed currency, of their vital foreign exchange for the consumption of luxury consumer items, etc. Well, Gold falls into the same category for this reason. Yes, we want people to go out and buy imports that will help build industry. We don't want them going out and buying, you know, luxury automobiles. But neither do we want them going out and buying gold. Because what does gold do for our national economy? That doesn't help build any industrial plants. That doesn't, you know, add to the resources of our country. It just means that you've got a safe haven for some of your money. So the ban was to prevent the use of India's currency in the purchase of what was considered by all a non-essential good. I mean, everybody except those who you know, had some money that they were trying to shelter. So it falls into the same category from the perspective of the government bureaucracy as any luxury good. In fact, even more so that you know, you really, nobody really needs the gold. Yeah, they want it to protect their money, but the fact is it doesn't add anything to our economy. Uh, it's just like, when you, as I said, when you go out and buy a luxury car, if it's an import, it's not building our economy. It's not making it any stronger. It's not giving us an industrial base. That was the reason for the ban. Of course, that immediately led to massive smuggling because people did want the gold for the very reason that they wanted to protect their investments, protect the money that they had. And what you get in international smuggling of gold are a series of closed syndicates. I mean, you had to be a relative expert in the gold market to be involved in this kind of thing. This was not a fly-by-night, you know, cigarette smuggling, etc. You could get in and out of, you know, as long as you knew how to get across a, a national border. Uh, and it wouldn't be that hard to sell smuggled cigarettes. But gold is a different matter entirely. Knowing who to purchase this from, uh, where you sell it, where the people are that want to buy it, that is all specialized knowledge. And therefore, these syndicates operate internationally. And usually they're operating on two levels. One, they're operating at the legitimate level of moving gold around, selling it to private parties on the legitimate level where it's being taxed, but they're also involved in smuggling. And these are the people that have the specialized knowledge so that they can do both. How important this network of contacts is was made clear in a robbery that occurred in 1967 in uh, London at Rothschilds, where a huge shipment of gold was stolen by a group of British robbers. Uh, their problem then was, where do they sell it? Uh, they couldn't, you know, they didn't have any contacts. And the syndicates weren't going to get involved with them because, of course, they were bringing this huge amount of publicity. They'd gone out and stolen, you know, this, you know, king's ransom worth of gold. And the gold smugglers don't want any part of this. They are also legitimate traders. And the last thing they want is the police looking into their vaults to see if, you know, you've got stolen gold. They don't need that kind of problem. So they weren't going to have anything to do uh, with the thieves. And, uh, the thieves. and as a result, uh, there was no place for these people to run. They tried shipping a little bit of, over into Europe. They got caught and wound up in jail because they weren't part of the inside network. And that's why stealing gold is not a very good idea because you're really going to have a hard time getting rid of it. Now, most of the gold is being moved uh, by airlines, uh, or through airlines, I should say, and again, by a courier system. And couriers had to be carefully trained. In fact, some of the syndicates bought several airlines, uh, or I should say planes, several passenger planes, uh, 
so that they could train the couriers. Because the way that the gold was smuggled is you'd wear a vest, and gold for smuggling was usually melted down into small, uh, well, they look like coins, they're really discs, or sometimes uh, little cubicles, uh, and you'd stick them in slots in the vest. But in the end, you can wind up carrying 20, 30, 40, 50 pounds of gold, and it's not very easy to do. Uh, you had to learn how to walk, how to bend over, uh, how to put up with the discomfort while you were flying in a plane, maybe seven, eight, maybe 12 hours, then get off the plane and still act as if you were carrying your normal body weight. And indeed, customs officials use that as their principal way of catching gold smugglers. They weren't worried about opening people's suitcases. They figured most people, you know, we're not going to put it in a suitcase anyways. Uh, what they looked for were people that seemed to be walking in an awkward fashion or bending over in an awkward fashion. That would tip them off that this was somebody that was probably smuggling gold. So you actually had to train these couriers in order to move the gold. For a time, Beirut is the gold smuggling capital of the Middle East. Uh, it is a place that has a large international merchant community, uh, ready access to a good harbor, etc. It was relatively easy. However, in 1967, you had the Six Days War between Israel and a number of uh, Arab countries, including Egypt, etc. And that disruption of the regional economy quickly undermined Beirut's position in the international gold smuggling process, and by the time the economy had settled down again, as we will see, the gold market had changed significantly. Another place where smuggling was prospering at this time uh, was in Dubai, okay? one of the Arab Emirates. Basically, uh, gold smugglers would bring the gold up the main river that flows into Dubai, uh, unload the gold. From there, the gold would be deposited, uh, for example, uh, to the First National City Bank or British Bank of the Middle East, uh, banks that were in Dubai. From there, the gold would then uh, be shipped out on dows, which are local sailing vessels. And these sailing vessels would sail a relatively short distance over to India. And there, they would, of course, have a huge market for the sale of their product smuggled in from Dubai. So Dubai becomes a major smuggling center for getting gold in to India at this time. Now there is the issue of, now that you got the gold there, how are people going to pay for it? This is smuggled gold, right? One way this was done was through under-invoicing. One of the simple methods for under-invoicing is, again, you're exporting your goods and you report that you are shipping out 10,000 uh, bales of silk, and in fact, you're shipping 15,000. You're smuggling the stuff out. The difference between the 10 and the 15,000 is what you use, the 5,000 bales, when they're sold by, again, your friend in London. That difference is used to pay for the gold. So you have an exchange. I export extra silk use the profits from that smuggled silk, deposit it in a bank account in London. It's then transferred to the gold smuggler's bank account in London or in Dubai, and then he ships me the gold. Another method for paying for it was through the currency black market. Almost inevitably, uh, developing countries have exchange controls. We talked about this last week. Uh, they set an official rate or rates, there may be multiple rates, uh, for the exchange of the local currency for dollars or other foreign currencies. So again, the official rate may be, let us say, uh, 50 to 1, okay, that you get. You have to have 50 local currency to buy $1. But the free market, in other words, if people were free to buy at any rate they could and buy as much as they could, they'd be willing to spend say 125 pesos, rupees, or whatever, they get a dollar. So what happens, and this is common in developing countries, uh, is that you can go to the black market. And there, local people pay tourists uh, far more than they would have gotten uh, at the official exchange rate. In other words, uh, the official exchange rate says that when the tourist changes in his dollar, he's only going to get 50 pesos. But you come to me in the black market, I'll give you 100 pesos to get that dollar. 
Now, I know that I can then resell that dollar for 125 pesos. I use those profits to help pay for my smuggled goods, for the gold that I'm smuggling in. So black market exchange currencies are used as a way of funding this. This is how we get a hold of dollars, how we make profits in order to pay for the gold to hold on to the value of our savings, of our earnings. In India, another method that was used was simply the export smuggling of silver. Although the import of gold was banned, the fact is the Indian economy was virtually awash in silver. It was considered far less value. Its price was fluctuated far more violently uh, than gold did at the time. And so Indians were more than willing to acquire silver and then use that to smuggle out of the country and to use those profits in order to pay for the gold that they smuggled in to protect their wealth. Uh, elsewhere, conditions vary. It isn't always just government bans. Uh, in Southeast Asia, because of war that was developing there, war in Vietnam, uh, there was a huge market uh, for gold in Saigon. Why? Again, because of the instability. People were afraid of what was going to happen to their wealth. So they were dying to buy gold in order to protect that wealth uh, in one of the few ways they knew how, put it into hide currency. I mean, people still do that today. The stock market went down the last few years. A lot of people were buying gold uh, to protect their money. They wouldn't, didn't figure they'd make much money on it, but at least they didn't want to see their money further devalued. Well, in these countries, with war, with unstable economies, that's a constant problem. Uh, one of the places that became central to all of this was Vientiane, Laos. Uh, Laos is the country that borders Vietnam, and there in Vientiane, there was a relatively low duty on gold, and therefore there was a lot of uh, importing of gold and then smuggling it into Vietnam where people wanted it for the purposes, again, of protecting their capital. Hong Kong, again, appears as a traditional smuggling center. It is one of the places from which gold is smuggled out to much of Asia at this time. Now, what would happen is that when gold was brought into Hong Kong, it would then be transshipped to Macau. Now, you probably remember Macau, Portuguese colony. It was shipped over to Macau because in Macau, the ingots of gold would then be melted down into the small disks that we use for smuggling purposes. Then the gold would be shipped back into Hong Kong, again, all of this smuggled, duty-free. Uh, and from there, the gold, now in small disk form, uh, would be deposited in banks. And from these banks, the gold would then be shipped to places like Japan, uh, other parts of Southeast, or parts of Southeast Asia, Indonesia, etc. So Hong Kong and Macau have this sort of, you know, special industrial relationship where Hong Kong gets the gold smuggled in in ingots. They are then uh, melted down, turned into discs that can be easily smuggled. They go back through banks in Hong Kong where the money is, where the gold is now supposedly legitimate. You know, it's been deposited by local people, uh, but then the bank can use it and ship it out as supposedly legitimate gold, non-smuggled gold, into these countries when in fact the whole process is a process of smuggling from the time of getting the gold into Hong Kong until it's shipped out into another economy. All of this is a smuggling process. However, the great market in gold was coming unstuck after 1968. What happened was that with the new agreement now that the private market for gold had fluctuating prices, gold lost its greatest attraction to people, and that is stability. If gold was going to fluctuate in price, maybe at the time you ordered your gold, it was $50 for an ounce of gold. By the time you get it, it's only worth $45 an ounce because the price fluctuated. How is this a hedge against inflation? It isn't. So the instability of the private market beginning in 1969 undermined much of what was the international market in gold. But again, this was not so much a market in a precious good. It was a market in currency stability. That's what people were trying to buy by smuggling gold. After 1969, gold was no longer that stable medium. They had to look elsewhere. When we come back, we're going to look at other consumer products, and we're going to look at controlled substances as they part become part of the smuggling network after 1945.